Hello and welcome to Please Expand. I'm Ahilius Rockney, and today I have with me on the podcast, <laughs> backed by popular demand, <laughs> once again, I my good you. friend Jay Velasco. I thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I'm actually surprised that you, you know, you, you asked me again. I'm a bit honoured, of course. Obviously, because uh, uh, the first time went so well. Yeah, obviously. I thought, you know, the overall uh, positive uh, I don't know what to say I just got a flood of emails mm, after our episode went out uh, uh, and, and for that I'm grateful and I'm grateful to be here again to the fans yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was wonderful to have you and it Thank was wonderful you. to read this book with you yes it was it was very interesting actually I, I, I was very looking forward to it when, when you uh, asked me to, to join you for this uh, episode and um, yeah um, I'm glad I did it obviously. yeah great so you know, the structure of this episode is uh, as before There'll be about 40 minutes of interview with uh, Greg Wolf, where we'll discuss his book, The Life and Death of Ancient Cities. We'll talk about the role of evolutionary mechanisms in urbanization. We'll talk about whether urbanization necessarily entails some kind of power relation. Like, do rich urban centers require poor places from which they gather their resources? And we'll talk about inequality as well in the archaeological record. Indeed. So scintillating stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So without further ado, Craig Wolf. Hello and welcome to another episode of Please Expand. I'm Mahelius Rockney. And I am Jay Velasco. And today we're very happy to have on the podcast with us, Greg Wolf author of The Life and Death of Ancient Cities and Natural History. Our interview today is divided into three sections. First, we will discuss the evolutionary framework of the book. Then we will discuss the emergence of inequality as a result of urbanization. And finally, we will discuss the similarities and differences between ancient and modern urban centers. Uh, Greg, thank you very much for being on the podcast. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Wonderful. So I guess one of the initial points of your book is that relying on ancient written sources as a way to understand uh, ancient urban centers or the ancient world as such has misled us into believing that they were grander than they actually were. Indeed, there seems to be a tendency in civilizations to aggrandize their founding. Why do you think that is? I think some of it's just a matter of perspective. From their point of view, of course, what they were doing was quite different from what had gone before. So that first generation who uh, built amazing buildings all over the Acropolis in the Archaic Age probably th thought, well, it was just villages here before and ruins, ruins of Mycenaean <laughs> Palace. And, and then the next year, when you jump ahead to the fifth century, what they're doing, they think this is so much better than what went before. So the kind of rising trajectory probably leads each, each generation to, uh, to think of what's, what's new and dramatic. Uh, it's only in retrospect that we look back with hindsight, which is always a bit different. Um, and we say, well, okay, it's, it's amazing, but it's quite small compared to modern cities. And uh, it's a relatively small proportion of the population involved in them. So, so I think it is sort of wh where you're standing determines your view. Right. Um, is this tendency to say mythologize uh, one's origins a specific to urban societies or can we see the same say in uh, very small communities? I'm sure it's not specific to urban societies, but right. one of the things that's unusual about urban societies is that they tend to use writing systems. So we have a lot more information about uh, you know, things like the Epic of Gilgamesh or Homer or Hesiod and, and their views than, you know, quite possibly there are just as complicated and interesting stories floating around in non-urban societies, but we don't have access to them. And um, it's really only modern day ethnographers or perhaps ethnographers from the 19th century onwards who are able to discover, for example, you know, things like the dream time uh, as talked about by contemporary Aboriginal populations in, Aust in Australasia and say, well, gosh, this is an amazing set of stories of foundation and, and belonging and place and people, but accessible only through oral testimony. And we've lost all that for the ancient world. Right, actually, um, and this is this is very interesting because I think you were telling me uh, not long ago we were discussing I think something to do with Plato uh, questioning why people believed um, Homer's uh, was something like that you mentioned to me yeah, once, which was, it seems to be, be very. It was the, sort of uh, this, the the centrality of the Iliad and the Odyssey for uh, imparting knowledge about other fields like medicine or 
uh, how to praise the gods and all this kind city of city building as well, yeah right, yeah and, uh, and we take it as authority when in fact you know it, it might have been something else more like um dramatic license perhaps uh, yeah. Way of putting it. yeah i mean I, th I think there've been so many generations of readers of the homeric epics that um uh, yeah people who were fir who first heard them rather than readers auditors uh, they will have understood one set of things from them about an extraordinary past i mean if you lived in Greece in the Arquette period, you saw the remains of Tholos tombs and Mycenaean palaces around you. And so Homer taught them about that. By the time you get the Hellenistic period, you're already getting um, scholars saying, oh, Homer's the best geographer, Homer's the best medic, Homer's the best whatever. And it becomes almost a kind of, um, uh, it's almost a competition to see how much you can claim for Homer. Well. And if you read, say, um, the Ro early Roman period geography of Strabo, there's a huge amount in there about how Homer knows all of geography long before Eratosthenes measured the circumference of the world and so on. So, and then, you know, there's a, a text that survives from the Villa of the Papyri, um, Herculaneum, on the good king according to Homer, where people have used Homer as a kind of urtext for political science. And, <laughs> you know, who wants to know about the good king? Well, you want to know about the good king in the age when the Roman emperor is have suddenly appeared. So, so you know, how do you control emperors? You tell them, if you want to be a good king, this is what you do because... Because Homer's look at Homer. Time, yeah. <laughs> so I think he's been read for many purposes in right, many periods. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is, this is exactly what Plato hates. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, just to go uh, straight to the point of your book, really, one does not come very often to think of the emergence of cities within this evolutionary framework. Could you begin by telling us a bit about how you adopted this position and what do you think is the advantage of this approach? It's always quite difficult to work out where you get your ideas from because you probably pick them up in the pub or somewhere else and read them <laughs> and then, decide, and then, you, then you, you mythologize the origin of your own thing. There we go. Um, for me, a sort of a key moment, I think, was very early in my career. I was in a universe that suddenly started an archaeology anthropology degree from scratch. And we all just had to suddenly invent courses that had never existed before. And that, that was enormously free to do this. To, and one of the courses invented was by Barry Cunliffe. And it was on sort of urbanism and state formation throughout the, the, the world. And, and we really would try and do sort of China and India and Mesopotamia. I don't think my answers were very good at that point, but it started me thinking about some of the questions. But so, but I mean, in terms of evolutionary theory, there've been a lot of other people pushing in this direction of saying, well, humans are not different from animals. We're a species like other ones. You can find precursors of this in Aristotle. We're social animals, and we know quite a lot about other social animals, and uh, we know quite a lot about how uh, communities work when they settle and how communities work when they move about a bit, and you can with some differences apply what termites and ants uh, do to what humans do. So that's one sort of approach. But I think fundamentally that the core thing for me is that we, are, we don't stand outside nature. You know, mm. We often talk about the environment as if there's us and the environment, there's us and the stuff around us, but we're, we're part of it. And we're increasingly low. Yeah, you know, most of the DNA in our bodies doesn't belong to the human species. It's all the other species that live inside us and around us. So, so really trying to think about these very long-term questions in terms of our species story just seems a sensible way to proceed. Right. Much like uh, evolutionary theory, which hypothesizes that species develop through random mutation, you argue that we almost sort of stumbled upon urbanization because of certain selective pressures. Could you please expand on how, given this approach, CITES came about? How does the process of urbanization look through your lens? Yeah, I mean, stumbling is important because it, the opposite would be intelligent design, the idea that somehow either we or someone outside ourselves is directing us towards an urban future. And that, that makes no sense in the modern world. And it's a bit like the Greek idea that you travel backwards into the future. You could see the past, right. but you can't see what's what's coming. So it's like you're sitting on a roller coaster, but the wrong way around. And so from that point of view, stumbling is, is right. Um, we have a, Throughout evolution, we find examples where big jumps are made when a species exploits for a new purpose, something it developed for an old one. So this might be a classic example is is dinosaur feathers, that feathers are not designed to help dinosaurs fly, but once they are covered in feathers, it's a lot easier to, to, to make that next move. And so 
there are lots of things that that make us urbanizable even though for most of our species sort of several hundred thousand year history we haven't lived in cities we only lived in cities for the last six thousand and even today there's many people who don't so we're a species that have these options and my, my thought is really that societies that are already agricultural so that means societies that have sort of you know, engaged a particular set of relationships with animals and plants around them since the beginning of the holocene at a certain point your numbers get to the point where urbanism becomes an option now presumably it's tried lots of times and presumably a lot of the time it fails and it fails so quickly it needs no, no traces all we see as archaeologists or historians are the traces of the successful experiments but right. over time clearly the city came to be something which was worth trying out and there are despite all sorts of disadvantages to living in cities uh, the advantages clearly outweigh them so that that's what i mean that we sort of in the same way that any animal species sort of you don't sort of animal species move by stages towards their new ecological roles and we've done the same so yeah uh it's interesting that you sort of uh opposed stumbling with intelligent design and i think uh, probably the sort of the historical narrative that you're arguing against is probably misled by this really uh strong idea that we sort of we willed ourselves into urbanization they were like we, we willed ourselves into all these things i was well, of that school of thought myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, you, you, you get this in Lucretius, don't you? A sort of idea of, 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 of powerful figures who set about to create cities and so on. Yeah. And, and perhaps even the, the idea of Gilgamesh being a shepherd of people, the idea that kings in Mesopotamia might, might herd their people together into a sheepfold to, for their purposes. Um, so I'm sure lots of people have imagined that voluntarism and will is the way it works, but it's... It clearly isn't right. any more than an elephant's ancestors willed themselves into having trunks or that, you know, the ancestors of seals thought we really ought to spend much more time <laughs> on the beach. <laughs> okay, yeah, but, uh, but, you know, I wonder uh, how much we can really, um, to what extent we can draw such a, sh a strong analogy uh, because, you know, we have, you know, we are self-conscious, you know, we're, we think at least we're able to sort of make certain decisions and uh, we seem to have choice in certain matters. I mean, I'm not disputing. I think you're very right to emphasize the environment and enabling conditions that allow for us to move into this direction of urbanization. But I wonder, is there any element of free choice, free will in this account? Yes, yes, of course. I don't want to suggest that, we, that we're simply sort of being propelled by something else. Uh, obviously not. And... I think human agency is really important to take account of, and it operates in several ways. One of the ways it operates is to make sense of what's happened already. We've been talking about mythologizing, but myth-making is a key way human agents operate. But another is to decide on course of action. If you think, for example, at something like um, the seeding of Greek cities around the Mediterranean, you know, clearly people sit down and they say, we want to do this. We think it's a sensible thing to do. It's going to cost us uh, because it costs a lot to create the boats and the ships and, and there's risk but we think those risks are justified so there's the agency selective pressure is what makes some of these ventures fail and others succeed and so what what when we look back down the telescope of history as it were we see the trace of the success stories that doesn't mean that everybody had a good plan and they all succeeded what this means is that enough of them survived but as you can just about see in Herodotus or the lyric poets, you can see that there were ventures that didn't work. There were groups who went to places that turned out not to be safe or not to be profitable. And I, th I think there must be a lot of churn in that early uh, Mediterranean, people trying stuff out and then, you know, settlements which didn't have enough people taking refugees from failed cities. Um, by about the fifth century, it's become much more stable. But in that early period, I think there's a lot of agency and trial and error and, um, you know, selective pressure is just looking at error from the opposite direction. And right. it doesn't, doesn't mean agency is always stupid. It just means that sometimes some things worked out and others didn't. And, right. Yeah. Uh, do you think that there was any communication? Is there any evidence for communication of successful or failed ventures between people? I mean, was there, 
this might be very difficult to see from up from up from the, so, so far away but is there any evidence to think that someone from a failed city might have went out and spawned another city that might have failed or succeeded for other reasons um, well, there's a little bit of the sort of the story of the, the the various routes by which the Phocians flee the Persian Empire and settle in various places and end up in in Marseille. So that's one example. But and there was a time where people imagined this was all very carefully planned. That, that um, and there's a, there's a strange set of ideas that that Delphi operates as a great kind of clearing house for information. That people say, hey, look, there's a great place here, good <laughs> harbour, uh, nice beach, uh, good fields, fresh water. But <laughs> yeah, we can't use it. But do pass it on if anybody else comes to the Oracle. <laughs> won't you? Um, and then against that, you think have thick stories like the the um, the late the Roman Republic, which is it's a period where it's spinning out what they call coloniae, um, all up and down Italy. And there's at least a few occasions where they don't hear back for a while, and eventually the Senate sends uh, sends emissaries to go say, "Well, how's that colony doing?" And it's nothing. There's nothing there. You know, there's tumbleweeds right. rolling down the empty street grid that people came, they saw, and they realized it was a disaster, and they quietly slunk away somewhere else. So, <laughs> I, I don't think there's perfect information flow. There's rumor. There's there's bits and pieces, but. Maybe in that early stage, where there's very few cities operating, you know, the, the cities who do the long distance journeys are a tiny subset of those who can sail. And that's true on the Phoenician side, true on the Greek side. There must be kinship networks. There's backwards for and forwards flow. There must be some sort of information like that. And also, I, I strongly suspect that quite often people don't just turn up on a distant coast and sail up and down till it looks good, that there are pre-existing relationships with local groups, because many of the places we find, the first Greek cities anyway, are places where local societies have begun sort of heading in a similar direction. And I do think most of these new settlements are in some ways kind of joint projects. I mean, mariners from the East bringing technologies, know-how, right. spread of things like viticulture in Spain and so on. It really does look like East Mediterranean have got something to bring to the party, but for, for the whole thing to work, you need people who control the land, who've got labor and so on. So I, I suspect that that's, those are the kind of connections of information that are really vital, rather than the sort of priest of Delphi writing long, <laughs> long hand notes to themselves as well. I'm sure someone will come along who's interested in Libya. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, if there is an evidence of failed ventures, can we derive conclusions from just successful ventures? I actually thought about a mathematician, Adam uh, Wald, who once um, in the Second World War, they brought him, they took him to America. And it had something to do with, uh, they needed to reinforce the bullet holes in the planes that they were coming back from the war. And the military asked him, like, well, do you know, we have all the samples, so we know the bullets, are, the bullets hit here and here. So does that mean we need to reinforce those? And then he came with this wonderful idea. He's like, no, no, actually, we need to reinforce where there are no bullets because those are the planes that don't come back. So Brilliant. it's, sort of, it's, Brilliant. Sort of, it's yes. the opposite. Uh, so, yeah, we, we, it's, it's fascinating, right. all this stuff. So um, moving on to another topic of, of your book, you draw attention to the development of inequality in uh, once humans move from agricultural communities to urban centers. Could you tell us why this is the case? Partly it's a sort of it's something you can see on the ground in terms of space, that if you look for where are the rich objects, they're not in the villages, they're in the towns or the temples. So there's there's a very clear spatial distribution of wealth. So that's one 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 aspect of it. We've people have suspected for a long time that early cities are created largely by coercion. Now it's probably not always true, but um there was a classic uh, story uh, developed by a man named Wittvogel about um uh, on oriental despotism um and his idea was that the early civilizations were all hydraulic civilizations they all depended on huge sort of taming great rivers and managing them and distribu you know, distributing water in the nile you know managing the the, the mud in in southern uh, mesopotamia and so on and that this could only really be organized by one powerful person now we i think that no longer really matches the evidence but there's there's Clearly, projects undertaken on a very large scale, that's quite difficult to imagine them all generated bottom up. So, so certain, certain and you know, egalitarian cities, very, very difficult to find. Now, I mean, if you look at house size, this is a good test. If you look at the first villages, they look like clusters of farmhouses, and they most of the houses look about the same. 
and this is true. Um, and then even before the end of the Neolithic, you begin to get sometimes a big house surrounded by others. It varies a lot from one society to another. But progressively, the general trend as you go into the Bronze Age, which is when cities begin to appear in most places, is you come to a city and there's one or two big houses and then there's a lot of much smaller ones. And so it's, it's that kind of measure of inequality, I think, in a very sort of basic sort of material level that, that's really convincing, quite, right. quite apart from sort of stories of kings and heroes and so on. Right. Yeah, I thought uh, it was an interesting way to measure inequality. I mean, it makes sense from an archaeological perspective. It's what you can find mm. on the ground. So, yeah, so the point is not that inequality emerges, is that we can uh, see inequality. We can see that it's existing and that we can see from this point in this initial point of urbanization to later points that it's growing. Yes, I mean, inequality and urbanization and cities are different kinds of things, aren't they? Because inequality is a more abstract concept and and right. cities are collections of bricks and stuff, basically. And so we infer inequality mm. from what we find on the ground or from what we're told by text. There's a problem with that process, which is there might be kinds of inequality that are not don't leave much of a, of a material trace. So, for example, there may be particular families in early agricultural societies who are extremely prestigious, have particular religious prestige, and that this doesn't manifest itself. And you know, we don't quite, I think that's quite likely Neolithic and societies have a certain degree of inequality because we know they went to war mm. and we know they built huge monuments like Stonehenge and, and um, other ones. So it's a little, again, a little bit difficult to imagine that happening in a society that's completely egalitarian, but but how people differ may be quite different. It may not be all about inequalities of wealth. It might not be about property. It might be about influence or right. power or prestige. And um, so inequality probably takes different forms in different human societies. Right. Yeah. You, you, you just mentioned Stonehenge as an example. Is that because that would have required a huge uh, labor force to get that uh, done? Yes, yes, it, it requires... I mean, people have done sort of man-hour calculations. I can't remember them, but they're enormous. And... Right. Um, individual stone but any complex monument uh, Gobli Tepli in 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 Turkey is another one of these but um, any and quite often they're clearly built and elaborated over hundreds of years so this suggests a kind of societal project but you know, like cathedral building or, or or building a great road but it's so, someone's presumably organizing it yeah right okay right in this part of the interview now moving on I would like to ask you to assess how ancient cities uh, look when compared to the present what do you think are the main similarities are there any or are there any similarities at all I, mean, I think they're very various and they get more similar over time so one kind of city that's become much more evident in recent years particularly through work in in the americas are very low density but very large cities so cities which have you know fields and compounds within them but not maybe high-rise buildings and maybe quite large green spaces between them. And so these low-density cities are less striking for us now because what we see particularly strongly are cities that have big monumental complexes in the middle, whether that's right. in Mexico or in, in Athens, um, and so or Ziggurat in Babylonia. So they do differ quite a lot in, in, in appearance, I think. Um, they have, there are sort of family resemblances. Because they have large numbers of people in, they tend to end up regulating movement and assembly spaces a bit. So some streets wider than others. And of course, once you've got what sort of arterial roads, then it's quite an easy step to think, well, this could also be a view path. This could be a way of making people see something. You can put something spectacular at one end if it takes people half an hour to walk along it. So right. these sorts of rather basic structs, monumentalizing structures right. reappear again and again in the new world, the old world, anywhere there are cities. So approaches, complex gates, roads, uh, stages, maybe a series of temples to at Karnak in Egypt that you go through. So that's one kind of logic. Um, then the other thing they've got in common is there are some really basic things you have to do. Which, I mean, if you live in a small village, it's quite easy to get rid of waste. If you wow. live in a city, you need to think about it. And equally, you need to think about getting water. So again and again, we find 
cities which have developed something that's like an aqueduct or a cistern or a combination of these two and we find ways of disposing of rubbish so that's that's just necessary that's if we think of cities as nests as human nests then, then we have to do all the same things that bee net, you know, beehives have to do we have to get get rubbish out and get get food in you know get get water in that provides some basic protection but the basic designs differ a lot you know, I, I think if you could hop from around the globe in the fourth millennium bc then you would see at first you'd say hey they're really different you know right. what you've got in egypt isn't like ziggurats in babylonia look at these people in anatolia it's all about walls and 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 impressive gates and you know who knows what's going on in europe with all these you know, long wooden palisades and things but <laughs> Yeah, nowadays our big cities look more alike, don't they? I mean, you fly right. into any airport anywhere in the world, there's a tarmac road, you go in, there's a great cluster of glittering skyscrapers in steel and 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 glass. And it's only really when you begin to see writing that you know whether you've landed in you know, Japan or um, or right, the yeah. Gulf or um, the Midwest. So, I mean, I think our cities are more have become more architecturally homogenous the nature right. cities were um one of the things that your book definitely uh, made me sort of uh, reevaluate the, con the relationship that we have with ancient cities and with the ancient world in general and um i don't know if you recall at the, uh, at the end of last year in, 20, uh, in 2020 there was um, a plan that was approved to create something underneath the uh, stonehenge and i saw i, I saw on twitter people like uh, tom holland and a lot of folk yeah. historians sort of getting together to um, condemn uh, something like this. What, 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 what is your position on, on, on an issue like that? It, it, the Stonehenge one is still very controversial, it actually, is. and there's still lots of positions. And it isn't one of those things where you can put, say, archaeologists on one side and developers on the other. That right. There's a sort of common agreement that we want to protect the monument, and there's a common agreement, too, that people have to be able to get around the country. And the trouble with Stonehenge is it isn't just a nice building in a corner. It's a it's a it's a historical prehistoric landscape. Right. It's amazingly elaborate, and around you know, that iconic set of circles, through ditches, roads, other complexes, Silbury Hill, all sorts of other things. And so, intervening anywhere in that landscape is difficult. And so, the dispute really is between people who think that at least putting a tunnel under will get will mean you can appreciate the land. The monuments in a green landscape without traffic noise and fumes and so on at the cost of disrupting an awful lot of the local archaeology when you're digging the tunnel okay. and it won't actually go under the stone but it's under the complex and those people who think well the cost of that destruction is just too great a price to pay i i, I find it very different i mean the I'm unhappy about the tunnel personally, but I also know that, that, that that's partly because people who have spent a lot of time looking at it in detail, not just Tom Holland, but also, who's very good on this, but also people like Mike Parker Pearson at UCL and so right. on, who worked a lot there, that they have severe doubts about it. So I, I, I'm i sort of going a bit with them as well as with my right. gut. But but it, all heritage monuments difficult. It's a crowded planet. There's, you know, seven to eight billion of us on this place. Archaeology used to be thought of as you find a tiny bit of it here and there. Now we know that anywhere you dig, there's archaeology. Okay. There's an amazing book called 500 Kilometres d'Histoire, which was um, a record of a French project to look at what was uncovered in building the rail and road links from Paris to the Channel Tunnel. Right. And so basically, someone has given you the opportunity to dig a 500 kilometre trench across northern France effectively random and they found <laughs> stuff every every couple of kilometers wow. from every period so yeah it's a it's been a crowded landscape it's been it's crowded out it's always been crowded so the, the you can't dodge the archaeology some archaeology is always going to have to suffer and most of us accept that you know people in the present have got some interests that need to be respected and you just need to design methods of recording and recovering information and maybe where you can divert something slightly whether it's the, the stonehenge road or hs2 or something you know how important does something have to be for you to dodge it we probably wouldn't run a motorway through westminster abbey knowing quite how far down it goes it's a bit more tricky yeah do you think this is a very modern attitude towards archaeological sites 
Yes, I do. Yes, I mean, even even in the 18th century, people are quite happily demolishing art sites they know are very ancient. Oh, I mean, they, yeah, right. Enlightenment, Erudy in, in, in France thought, well, yeah, yeah, the past, the past, but, you know, Ancien Regime, that's yesterday, you know, we've got a modern world to build. <laughs> and got to move on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Maoist, Maoist approaches destroy the past, create a future. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you? I have to interest you. What, what do you think about the what was done to Plaka and the Acropolis and areas around that in the creation of the Greek state? Because that yeah, also yeah. involves both a project of curation and celebration, mm. but also a project of destruction. Yeah, I um, so I haven't thought much about that specifically, but oddly enough, when I, you're the Greek one. I, I am the Greek one. Yeah. <laughs> but when I uh, I was when I found out that the uh, they were spending a lot of money to sort of reconstruct the Acropolis and the adjoining temple, I was quite I, I thought it wasn't a good uh, use of money. I thought uh, mm. for me there was a distinction between uh, looking after something and enjoying it and trying to recreate yeah. it as if it were now. I think there's yeah. something worth it's, it's obviously worth keeping, but it's also I don't think it's worth holding on to in exchange for other things that could be done with that money. Yeah, it's a, it is, yeah, particularly when you've got a society that has a real financial crisis. But I was also thinking about the earlier period where you think of those wonderful watercolours that show Placa as a forest of minarets. Oh, yes, yeah. And mosques and, mm. and you know, the, as, as Mary Beard says in, in her book on the, on the Parthenon, mm. that the Parthenon has been used as a church and as a mosque for much longer than it was ever used a place to worship Athena. Yeah, so exactly. it's a question now, which past do we preserve? Exactly. Do we want to preserve Byzantine Acropolis or, or Ottoman Acropolis? Or you know, why did we pick Periclean Acropolis? And why not knock all of that down and look for the Bronze Age Acropolis <laughs> with a really, really interesting palace there and maybe more Linear B tablets, who knows? Yeah, so yeah. It's always a choice I and mean, you can't, it, it's not a, never an on-off switch, is it? You can't say, well, keep the past or get rid of it. It's, it's what past do you keep and how do you keep it? And as you say, well, how much are you prepared to invest in curating it? And yeah. how much should you improve it how, to make it a bit more like it used to be the yeah. way you wanted it to have been? Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's tricky. It is very <laughs> tricky, it is, yeah. So when we think about the uh, ancient world, we tend to think of the individuals of this world as being exclusively concerned with sort of immediate economic needs. And when we sort of look a bit higher up in society, maybe militaristic needs. Uh, nowadays, we tend to think that urban communities should also serve as bubbles of emotional support for its inhabitants. Uh, there's a sort of a idea that the individual has certain needs that go beyond the merely economic. Mm. Um, do you think that this is something that can be gleaned in the past, or is this also something very modern that we're looking at? I think there's modern and ancient elements to it. One of the modern elements, I think, is the way in which we think about cities as sort of, you know, complexes that serve individuals in very different ways. Mm. And I don't think that's an ancient idea at all. I don't think people thought, well, let's create a sort of multifunctional space where some people might do philosophy and others might do athletics or something that, as far as we can tell from literary texts, which is all we've really got to get into their mentalities, things are thought of much more collectively. You know, so, so people did build collective things and... Yeah, by the Hellenistic period, people are building parks for public use and they're creating right. you know, spectacular monuments which people will enjoy. And by the Roman period, great nymphaea, so um, enormous statue complexes at the terminals of aqueducts, so water pours down in spectacular fountains. And th this serves no practical purpose. It's just as easy to put in a tank unless you want people to see it and to be impressed and to feel glad, and uh, as people do when they see rushing water, sort of artificial recapitulation of natural wonders in the middle of cities. So I think it's ancient to want cities to serve the people, and particularly in those cities that have a, a democratic orientation, so the Roman Republic or, or classical Athens, where people, where orators do talk about what the demos needs, what the demos wants, and so on. I think that's, that, that's something which is quite ancient, or has ancient components to it, but but... You know, th this wasn't a world that thought citizens should be free to become any kind of citizen they wanted to be. I mean, you read Pericles' oration and you look for sort of 
traces of individual self-actualization and things like that or interest in diversity agenda and it's not there you know <laughs> there's one there's an ideal citizen and Pericles tells them who he is right and he's the dead one he's talking about mm. <laughs> okay yeah i think uh, one one of the things i thought about when we were reading um the sections actually I, I actually really like one specific section of your book when you mentioned that in some places there are some uh, temples and that everyone would sort of cooperate to build a temple and that some mm. rich people would sort of pay as well it would be seen as something interesting and i thought about our modern conception of being a citizen of a given city and i was wondering whether if the sort of uh uh, I don't want to get. Um, uh, I don't want to speak economics, but sort of the the marginal benefit of each individual as being part of the city has somehow decreased. And I mention this because, um, as a result of uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic, um, there is some data that suggests that young people who were in London, for instance, um, decided to leave London because precisely the city itself didn't sort of met this first of all an economic need and secondly for an emotional need that they could make more meaningful relations outside and i was i actually told Achilles a few times that's true i mean i i i i don't think there is anyone out there a young person for instance or, or old person that looks at the big ben and of course recognize the big ben as part of their history their innate history but they don't feel like they below the, the, they build a big ben that it doesn't really represent them as as people yeah it's um it's really difficult to work this out, isn't it? I mean, I mean, the London example, there's so many ways in which some younger people are different from some others. And one right. of them is that they often live in quite cramped accommodation. Exactly. And so, you know, it's fine if you're like me, I've got sitting in a big garden, I can work from home, I've got a kitchen, several bedrooms, That that's fine. But, um, you know, if I was living in a shared accommodation or one bed or a studio flat, lockdown might seem less attractive in the city. And also, of course, many younger people in London are, working in precarious positions and many of them simply lost their job if they, they had no way of living so so I suspect some of it might be that but I wonder I mean the younger people I talk to as, as, as a teacher and also my son lives in London he's in his 20s um right there are areas of London which they do feel strongly identified with you know, parks for example That's where true, yeah. they, or sports areas where they can go cycling or running or something like that so yeah, maybe they don't fasten on the same monuments, but I think each each generation inhabits the city it's born into in a different way. And, and that's particularly true today, where things are changing so fast. But also must have been true in the past. It must have been true that, you know, the generation born into Cicero's Rome, you know, lived in it in a different way than the people who've been born into, you know, the Rome of the Gracchi or something. So of course. So um, you look at what, what, what Augustus does into the city of Rome. Quite a lot of his activity is focused on creating popular spaces, isn't it? Public gardens, um, you know, baths, right? Parts adorned with water and so on. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and this That's would be sort of, is, this, is this because uh, he wants to do this? He thinks this is a great <laughs> idea, or because he's gotten some feedback from some orators <laughs> that told him the people want this? I think it's like the old gag from the BBC sitcom about a left-wing government that abolishes second-class travel, not first class. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Right. Yeah, what Augustus and, and others give to the people is what the aristocrats had had for themselves. Right. There have been gardens and statue complexes and libraries in the late Republic. It's just you had to go and be a friend of Lucullus to get into them. And... <laughs> <laughs> um through, throughout your book, you highlight that great urban centres retain their position through the exercise of imperial power. Uh, in effect, also nowadays, advanced economies are often criticised for extracting sort of cheap resources and labour from less developed parts of the world, and that without such actions, these cities or these projects and, and these societies could not be sustained. Do you think this kind of relationship is inherent to the creation and preservation of exclusive um, urban centres? I think it probably is, unless, except where you have cities that are so small and so close together that virtually everybody can share in them. And it's been argued that Greece is, an, is one of those exceptional cases. Right. Um, that the, In the classical pit, there are huge numbers of cities, but most have only a few thousand people, and most are an easy walking distance to their neighbour. So that's a bit different. But once you get the 
the sort of lo larger scale structures you're talking about, yes, I think that it, it is inevitable that these differentials of opportunity operate both ways, right. that right. country folk end up being called, you know, we are termed like rustic, yokel, peasant, <laughs> are not usually terms of approbation, yeah. are they? They're terms that, that betray an urban bias in the way we look at the quality of life. Well, nowadays being rustic, I think it's, it's quite yeah, It's quite nice. Though. It's quite expensive as well. It's quite, it's quite expensive vintage to be rustic. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The other day, I saw a vintage <laughs> chair. It was like far more expensive than the yeah. one. No, um, you're right. You're so rustic and artisan have been reclaimed, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> rightly so, yes. But, but not by the artisans. No, they didn't, I know. <laughs> uh, so just There's a... artisan dry cleaners near where I work in London. Oh, really? <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> I have no idea what it means, but it's, it's in the it's kind of street where everything's an artisan. <laughs> so yeah. So, <laughs> so just uh, as a quick last question before we wrap things up, we ask all our guests to tell us a bit about their future research plans. Um, in which areas are you looking to expand? So uh, what should we expect? <laughs> um, well, w whenever I finish a big project, there's always sort of aftershocks, so the things that you sort of thought of at the last minute, or that you get interested in. So there's a little bit of that. So a little bit of urban stuff still, and particularly about urban resilience, right. uh, which is a big topic today for what makes some cities more resilient and some less resilient. Right. And um, I'm one of, you know, there's quite a lot of people have got interest. There's Andrew Wallace Hadron in Cambridge. There's a really good research group in Bergen. Um, and so various people are quite interested in, in a sort of what lessons can you learn and you know what why 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 was ancient cities so why were they so stable why is it that if you're a city by 500 bc you're probably still a city a thousand years later um so that a little bit of that but that'll just be papers and so on the, the next book um is about mobility it's about um oh different kinds of mobility in the ancient world, probably with a sort of Roman base and probably slightly less huge time span than this one, right. than the city's book. But um, I, we've talked for about 20 years uh, as a discipline about how people did were in contact in terms like connectivity and exchange and travel and mobility, used an awful lot. And I'm trying to make this a bit more precise and work out where people could move, where they couldn't. I mean, we began talking a little bit about the spread of news and I mean that's also something that's that, that is affected quite a lot if there's very little long distance travel during the winter right. month so you know, your Mediterranean becomes a, a world of people wondering what's going on at home throughout the winter and then when spring comes people begin to get news of you know deaths and births and raids and wars and political disputes at the other end of the Mediterranean and then it, when it's winter again it, it's the big quiet news quiet so things like that I'm quite interested in so Looking at the cap carrying capacity of ancient boats, how many people could move? I think probably very few. I think probably even at the Roman peak of movement, there's probably only one in a thousand people make a long distance journey every year. So most, so it's a world where most people live in very small horizons or move just between two or three neighbouring cities. Mm. And then there's a very small number of people who zip all over this vast empire that maybe takes 60 days to cross. So mm. that's that's part of it and also gender there's a book that i'm co-editing with a colleague on gendering gender and roman imperialism but also gender and mobility so very few women i think moved long distances in the ancient world except in chains so so there's a female slave trade but most of the other people who move about long distances seem to be men so that's quite interesting thinking how women's experiences are more constrained well many men's experiences are constrained but it's easier for men to break out, go further afield, mm -hmm. and many more opportunities as traders or soldiers or whatever. Yeah. So, so those are some of the directions it's heading in. Okay, I'm not going to tell all the other books under contract. <laughs> <and> make it look <laughs> like I'm one of those crazy guys who signs contracts without any really realistic idea of when I can fill them out. <laughs> well, we look forward to, yeah, to definitely do. read more of you. We really enjoyed the Life and Death of Ancient Cities. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very that. much for your time. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome back. That was Professor Greg Wolf. Uh, Greg, thank you very much for your time. And now this is the part of the episode where we have the post-interview discussion. We'll discuss in a little more detail some of the elements of the interview that inter interested us most. So, Jay, 
why don't you kick us off? Yes. Well, um, obviously, as we've uh, you know heard in the interview, this this is a book that discussed uh, why we created cities, how and and precisely when. Now, just a bit of background, though, I think it, it might be helpful. A comment that we came across a lot during the review stage um, was how different and inventive was uh, this book's position when it came to you know cities as um, part of nature. Uh, Great Wolf mentioned to you at the beginning of the interview that there is this conception of seeing human beings as sort of exogenous to the environment, or rather that we think the environment is exogenous to us when in reality we're part of it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and, j- and just to be clear, when Greg mentioned that, he was thinking of those historians who claim that our process of civilization was this uh, this act of the will, right. the soul, the human soul, the spirit, and that it did not require or it's not dependent on certain biological processes to have occurred in the first place. You know, so he thinks that, you know, we are part of the environment insofar as it played a role in our development. And specifically with regard to the book, it played a role in the process of urbanization. Yeah, precisely. I mean, what he, what he refers to as uh, selective pressures, right? Right, yeah. So a selective pressure is, uh, you know, di- a dictionary definition is an external agent that affects an organism's ability to survive, right? So, for example, the availability of resources, uh, environmental conditions, or biological factors. These are all types of selective pressures. Yeah, uh, Correct. Now, now you and I have a long discussion about this during our reading stage, particularly surrounding the question of human agency, which we also discussed in the interview. Right, yeah. So, yeah. Reading the book, one gets the impression that urbanization occurred randomly as a response to selective pressures. For example, you know, you can more easily defend yourself against enemies within the walls of a city than in an agricultural setting. And so people were sort of selectively pressured yeah. to live inside a walled city. And I struggled with this view because it seemed to remove human agency from the urbanization picture. But surprisingly, though, I mean, he was fairly reasonable during yeah. the interview. I mean, but, but uh, the way he dealt with human agency, but, and by this I'm not saying he wasn't um, reasonable uh, in the book, but what he's saying is, you know, we were never destined to live in cities, but we were pre-adapted to cities. That's how it comes across in the book. Now, during the interview, he was, but the reason why I said reasonable is that he came to, you know, recognize that, not everything can be attributed to this, you know, pre-adaptation in accident, just, you know, call it one way. Yeah, and yeah, and it's just such a fascinating question, you know, uh, where do we draw the line between the pre-adapted traits that enabled urbanization and the choice to urbanize, you know, if, if indeed mm. there was a, a moment of choice? Um, well, if you ask me, I hope this was a question, um, <laughs> if, if you're asking me, this, I mean, this is a sort of, you know, nature-nurture debate, mm. um, quite frankly. They are very tricky questions because, in the end, everything is reduced to, you know, my beliefs versus yours. I personally have issues with thinking of cities as natural objects. In fact, I can't separate the concept of urbanization of cities from human agency. I mean, they seem to be <laughs> one for me. I mean, the, the result of one for another, you know? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so let's think about how a city is different to an ant colony, for example, right? Right. That's an example that uh, Greg uses often to show the sort of <laughs> yeah. the natural ancestry of the yeah, city. Oh, yeah, well, the 12-year-old kid in, inside me wants to say that cities have tarmac. <laughs> 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 what I'm, I mean, I guess, you know, cities are the place where, you know, um, oh, God, how can I put it? Uh, cities are the place where intelligent beings live. Mm. People with big brains, like ours. Now, an ant colony functions in so far as it provides the ants of said colony with food and protects them from environmental threats. And if I may go a bit further on this... Please, you always do. Ants never pay taxes. And <laughs> to live in a city, you need to pay taxes. Right, yeah. Okay, so we might say that we don't... They are about responsibility taxes, <laughs> you know? Responsibility to your fellow citizens. And you can only be responsible if you're a sentient, Absolutely. self-conscious being. Indeed. Okay, so, so we might say that we don't just... Like, we, we, we humans, we don't just do things to provide food and shelter, right? Yeah. Our activities stretch beyond those immediate needs. Completely, yeah. And, and you know, and for us, our immediate needs multiply as, you know, time goes. An immediate need now is to have, you know, a lane for ambulances and, uh, you know, for the, for the firefighters, whatever. 
or having lampposts when you know when you're drunk and you can't find the keys when you drop them on the street and the way Crucial. back home from a pub. Crucial. Mm, indeed. Um, yes. So yeah. So these things seem to go beyond the kind of natural concerns that animals have. Though, when I, I mean, I, I like to, you know, I like to think of both sides. I guess those who would want to push a naturalistic agenda will say something like, "Well." Ambulance lanes are just a more <laughs> complex form. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that, that, and that's a problem. You know, this view, you can get away with anything. Yeah. So, like, an ambulance lane is just a more complex form of safety, right? Yeah. So, they, it, it finds a way to reduce everything to some kind of natural explanation. Like, if you look hard enough, everything we do Indeed. serves some kind of basic need. Completely. And, you know, and you can say, of course, I mean, these people who are saying, but by these the way, people. these people. <laughs> Sounds very aggressive. And I... <laughs> On the enemy of the week, <laughs> and it's this people, uh, not those. This, you know. I, I think we're much nicer than people will get. Will yeah, think. yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Just, sorry, I just got heated think, <laughs> thinking about taxation and respons- <laughs> responsibility. Um, I've paid my you. taxes. You know, I pay so, my taxes, and you should you pay yours as well. You know, all, all um, two quid. <laughs> <laughs> Um, talking about that, I received a scam the other day, a scam call from I HMRC. Right. That, you know. And they opened a, a criminal investigation. And that, yeah, almost like, you know, like we're following you. Like, look back in the car. <laughs> <laughs> I received one of those yeah, in a few it's days. awful. But yeah. anyway, so yeah, you can say this, this you know, these people can say that, you know, these things are complex forms of safety. Um, the problem is that nothing, I mean, nothing is really complex on its own, right? And, and I think that that's the important here, uh, the important bit here. Concepts have many layers, and, and, and most of these layers are necessary. Um, you can always reduce something to a fundamental, but you know, if, if you do that, you're going to leave out very important aspects of the concept itself. Mm. It's, like, it's like reducing beef wellington to a necessary calorie intake for survival. I mean, they're not. They're, they're, they're wonderful things to eat. Um, but I mean, if 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 we were to think just as calorie intake, you would just need what a plant, a mushroom, a couple of seeds. You know, all these things people put in, in, in blenders these days, and that's and that's it. But would you want that for Sunday dinner? No, no. Yeah. You want beef Wellington with gravy, yeah. thick bread gravy. <laughs> Very, yeah. yeah, we seem to care about taste and presentation, right? But that's I mean that's the thing though with cities. When you think of Great cities. We have, you know, the wonders uh, of the world wonders, wonders of the world. Seven right? wonders the of the seven world. Seven wonders. And they are all about taste. They're, none of them are tasteless. Yeah. If you think about sure, it. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So f- for it to be an accident, I mean, come on. Right, yeah. And to bring this back to the book. Yeah, sorry. From the sort of the hanging gardens so of Babylon. <laughs> <laughs> whilst we agree that an ant colony and yeah. a city are not the same thing. Would we not say that an ant colony is a kind of proto city? Let's say you know we're, we're trying to get as close to Greg as we can. Okay, is, is an ant colony not a kind of proto city or a basic example of a city upon which we have built a more complex structure? You know, or, or, or are we just completely detached from that? Uh, I mean, as I say, I mean it's complex. I would say yes and no. What I'm trying to say is, look, an ant colony might satisfy the structural and organizational conditions of urbanization. Sure, things you know. The things that won't change with time, it, you know, there are uh, hierarchies and people have a particular role and right. so on and so on. Um, nevertheless, a city today is different. I mean, we discussed in this interview as well near the end uh, regarding the lack of um, uh, emotional needs in, in, in cities. Mm. Um, in particular, I mean, at least in, in, in the UK, um, young people prefer to live in the countryside. Uh, recently, they've, they've been moving out. Because of um, the pandemic. First of all, because of the pandemic, but also because they kind of realize that, you know, big cities, you know, th- what they want is to create emotional bonds and connections with people and places that, you know, naturally in a city, you can't. I mean, it's too expensive sometimes. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's an element that I guess is obviously missing from an ant colony. Yeah, completely. Right. I mean, all those things, you know, uh, you know. Okay. I think this is a good place to move on to another point. Yes. I liked Greg's response to our questions concerning urbanization and inequality. Right. And maybe we'll talk a bit about whether cities necessarily breed inequality later. But for now, I'd like to just focus on the idea of inequality in rural settings. Yeah. Well, I mean, he drew attention to kind of the importance of uh, archaeological evidence uh, that we simply don't know whether these rural places had inequality. Um, the way it works is, you know, they look at... at, at at the site, and they see how many possessions people had, 
And that somehow is evidence to say whether a place had inequality or not. Now, let's remember that these people, I say these people a lot. I've <laughs> just, I just realized that I ran the group in the world as like those. The um, people of 40,000 years yeah, ago. Yeah, the people 40,000 years ago, uh, based on current available archaeological evidence, didn't have imaginary money like we do. And so the only thing they, the only thing we know they had with certainty were, you know, pots and pans. Right. So it makes sense that to measure inequality, uh, uh, to some degree, um, you can measure it by the amount of pots and pans buried in a given plot of land. Right. Okay. And as we know, people in agricultural communities didn't amass possessions in the way they did in urban centers. Mm. And we also know that the sizes of accommodation were generally the same. You know, so the question arises, did inequality come about with urbanization or are we merely able to measure inequality thanks to the archaeological evidence left right. behind by urbanization and that, in fact, mm. it has always existed? I mean, often, I, uh, one of the things that I used to think when reading this book uh, is, you know, if we went extinct, right? <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to put the, uh, so let's, let's Let's start from there. Yeah. We go extinct and then aliens land here mm. in the year 4 million post event. Um, they would probably measure inequality in the same way archaeologists measure inequality in, in ancient times, in ancient cities. They will, you know, they will assert, for instance, they will dig stuff, and they will def- they will be 100% sure that a place called London, or they, whatever, uh, was richer than a place called, I don't know, Brisbane, based on the number of object- objects they found in both places. Okay, and why? Why? Must, why? Yeah. Well, you know, of course, as I said, you know, I was talking about imaginary money. If you delete all of those servers and you have no way of knowing that money existed, you can. You are only left with what is there with buildings, right? Right. Um, so Brisbane might actually be wealthier than London. Exactly. Which is that we can't know if we're just looking at yeah, the physical. Exactly. Objects. But on the basis of the physical evidence, in this case, a lot of buildings. They might as well think, you know, the the richest place on earth was a, co- a place called Hong Kong. Right. Because there were so many buildings in such a little piece of land. Okay, so yeah. that means that, you know. Yeah, and that's a good point. And, um, yeah, there are kinds of inequality that don't leave behind the ar- an archaeological record. You know, in your example, that would be uh, digital money. Yeah. Things that wouldn't survive. Indeed. Um, the tempest of time. Mm. And... <laughs> <laughs> Very dramatic take, episode. Yeah. <laughs> this is what happens when you invite someone more than once. You know, they, they just get a, a climate and then they <laughs> it becomes really dramatic. Carry on, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Greg mentioned this, mm. and, uh, that it is conceivable that a family or an individual might have, let's say, religious prestige in a community, you know, which naturally means that they are higher up in the hierarchy than other people. Yeah. And, I mean, you might say, well, you know, there's your inequality. But I think we have to, you know, actually talk about what inequality is. You know, is having yeah. religious prestige inequality? I would say, I mean, I would say so because if you know, if if you were a priest or whatever they had at the time, uh, you by definition you're, dif- you're differentiated from the rest of the tribe, um, right. and having that sort of higher rank, higher position in the social chain. Only means that, you know, you could, I don't know, I'm just making stuff up, like, mm. most of the day. Um, but, you know, you can eat more, and you can, you know, you have more water, because of, uh, people give you pods, because they're offering, whatever. Yeah. Um, so, the fact that you were in this position makes, yeah, that you would amass more things, absolutely. Um, and that would, I think it's a measure of inequality, physical, but also um, non-physical. Uh, the fact that, you know, he was unequal than the rest of them, because he was someone... Like a priest or yeah. priestess. Or yeah, but yeah, I guess I'm just, you know, this is a very uh, Marxist notion of inequality, right? Mm. That, you know, yeah. just because you have more of something, things are, it, it has this negative connotation. Yeah. Right? Whereas, you know, I don't know, maybe this individual was just, you know, they were special in that community and that was the way you show their specialness. Sorry, that's, uh, the studio here and, is falling off. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that, and, <laughs> So yeah, Karen, yeah. And that was the way you show their specialness mm. by them getting certain privileges in the community. Does that mean that people were being mistreated? Like that there was sort of inequality in that sense? I'm not sure we Def- can I was I'm not sure we can see that in the record. I, I def I I don't think I don't know. I, now I'm thinking whether if this inequality will translate into the physical realm. Right. Uh, with I mean I'm sure the bones of a fat person mm-hmm. 
Uh, you can tell if someone was fat or not by the bones. And right. if and if scientists haven't figured this out, I mean, this is a basic element too. Jay is an archaeologist. <laughs> <in science. laughs> I mean, it would really surprise me that we don't know that, but I'm sure. I mean, I've seen you know ha- I've seen the crazy stuff online. I mean, if they can reconstruct mm. the face of of uh, Tutankhamun, Tutankhamun, right, yeah, yeah. surely they can tell whether. So, so my point is, if if a priest of priestess received more food, they will get fatter. They could tell that by the bones, the remains, if there are any. But obviously, we're talking about. A long time. I actually ago. think I just realized that we are there talking are probably about no, uh, probably no bones. Left, so, so I mean that's why I guess they're focused. You see, so this is why you production. listen to this podcast because here's where you get expert opinions <laughs> of informed individuals. So yeah. Okay. And what about the thesis that cities necessarily breed inequality? You know, now we're not just talking about the possessions between mm. people in a city, but about the fact that a city needs to draw huge amounts of resources outside of itself to yeah. sustain itself you know that's sort of one of the big themes in the book yeah i mean uh you know not only two people live in cities as a thing many people do right uh the concept i associate with inequality is a scarcity um mm. uh, as an economist that's that's kind of the two l- that you link together and the thing with the scarcity is that uh, our motives are sort of infinite and, and and resources are limited and the more people live in the more people live in a city the less land is available. The more that land costs, the more power comes with each piece of land you owe. So, and so on and so on. So, yeah, I would say, yeah, of course, I think cities, by definition, breed inequality. I mean... Okay. So, I think that's probably all we've got for today. Yes, exactly. It was pretty good, actually. Yeah, it was really yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was a pleasure to speak with. Yes. Um, Thank you for coming on no, the podcast no, again. I, I do hope, you know... I didn't put you off with my theory about the aliens coming. <laughs> but uh, um, but yeah. anyway, uh, you know, I thank you for, for having me around. And uh, I guess our listeners should know that you'll be coming on the next episode. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. So the next episode will be... Because uh, you are predicting the demand for this one. Oh, of course, yeah. And, and you know... I suspect my inbox is already full. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, that, you, <laughs> I'll be seeing you next month anyway. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, the next episode of Please Expand will be on John Barton's uh, History of the Bible. Excellent book. Wonderful book. And we'll be talking about where the Bible came from, how it was put together, and a bunch of problems that come with this new, cutting-edge, biblical, historiographical knowledge. Yes, historiographical knowledge. It's a big word. It is, yeah. Uh, Please... uh, Follow me on Twitter at Please Expand with just one E. And make sure to visit my website, www.pleaseexpand.com, for more information about upcoming episodes. Uh, once again, Jay, thank you very oh, much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'll uh, right. see you soon. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.